in DC. We're just hoping that you listen. Welcome, everyone, to District Divided, a DC sports podcast. I am Amit. That is K. Dot, and all of you are here because you want to talk about the insanity. You want to talk about the craziness of round one of the NFL draft, and we are going to get to it. We're going to get to our thoughts on the trade back as well. But first things first, we have got a brand new wide receiver and weapon in Jahan Dotson. Okay. Penn State wide receiver, four-year player over there, 91 catches last season. By all accounts, great dude off the field and burner on the field. So we're going to begin with our thoughts on him. Then we will get to the trade back. We will get to the craziness of round one, and then we'll give you maybe some names to look at here on day two. But first things first, KDOT, how are you doing? And what were your thoughts on Jahan Dodson at pick 16 after the trade back? Uh, I'm doing well, especially after a crazy ass night watching the draft. What a night. Um, I, the first thing I will say after like, let's say an hour after the pick, I'm already sick and tired of the Josh Doxson jokes. They yeah. Oh, same. Yeah. Just, just stop. They're not funny. They're not. Come on. And there, I, I think there are actually legitimately some fans that have a bad taste in their mouth about this new pick because of Josh Doxson. It's like, shut the fuck up. Um, beyond that. Look, uh, I guess we'll get into more about the way the draft kind of shook out. So just as far as Dotson himself, I'm cool with it because of what it is that he brings to the offense. I mean, we talked about it more of the not the last uh, few weeks as we've been prepping how high I was in like Chris Olave. Now, does Dotson have that Chris Olave speed? No. But in offset from the Chris Olave thing, which is the same thing they were saying about Garrett Wilson, he's a lot more physical a player than those two guys, which is something that you got to look at this offense. And that's something that I've, I've been kind of craving. I've had the criticism for Antonio Gibson, as far as playing at the frame that he does and how it is that they avoid contact. Terry McLaurin is like the only deep threat we really have. And he's running mostly go routes. I mean, you can run everything in the route tree, but you need somebody else to kind of take the brunt of the offense away from him. And I think that this is something that this guy does. Uh, if you look at his frame, what he's a uh, 5'10, 170 something, 180, probably by the season starts. Um, he's a guy that can really line up anywhere on the field. And it's the same thing you kind of look at with a Curtis Samuel lining up anywhere on side of the field. We know Terry's going to be one of those outside receivers. Curtis Samuel, they've tried him as far as the outside, but I actually think he's better suited doing all kinds of things on the offense, like a gadget sort of player. And I think Dotson can do the exact same thing. He rarely lined up, I think it was 20% of snaps or something like that at Penn State. He lined up in the slot which, okay, he can do it, and I'm sure he will under our offense, but we can really move him around. And I think that that's what we're looking at with this offense is how many guys that we have on this offense that are really players that can do anything. How many players that we have that you can scheme an offense to where the defense has no idea what's coming to them. And I think that's something that we can look forward to. When you have a J.D. McKissick who can catch the ball out of the backfield and run it, you get an Antonio Gibson who can catch the ball out of the backfield and run it. When you've got a Curtis Samuel who can catch the ball out of the backfield and run it. When you've got a Dotson who, along the lines of like, what it, that he's not a burner like a Tariq Hill, but he doesn't avoid contact, kind of like a Tariq Hill in that smaller frame, or we saw what people are talking about, like Debo Samuel, even though it's a little bit bigger. Um, you're, you're looking at these guys in the receiver position to kind of do anything. And I, I like the idea of you have this, this, this other added tool to the to the box and beyond that i also think it lights a fire into the receiving core that is there on the team right now there are a lot of players that we have kind of fallen in love with at least to some degree that we're still waiting to see more of deami brown i think all of us are rooting for him to do something at, but yet he didn't really show the flashes that we really wanted to see from him last year antonio gandy golden i don't know what's going to end up happening with him with how many guys we do have them. but at least we know training camp there's going to be dudes really really competing for these positions for these slots that are on the field and the idea that we now as a washington commanders team can legit line up with a four receiver set and it be a legitimate thing that to me is just it allows scott turner to really be able to put his mark on this offense and maybe create some sort of identity and maybe that identity is you have no fucking idea what it is we can do for you <laughs> and so i just want to say excellently said we now have weapons, right? We've been talking about wide receiver at 11 for quite some time. Uh, we talked about Kyle Hamilton, of course, and we will get to our thoughts on the trade back and stuff like that in just a moment here. 
but we wanted a weapon. And now we may have a quarterback in Carson Wentz as well. Well, what do we know about him? He likes to let the receivers make a play. In that respect, mm-hmm. Terry McLaurin's excellent, right? He's one of the best wide receivers in the NFL when it comes to catching a contested ball. And Carson's going to give him a few of those. Jahan is of a similar mold. We didn't talk about Jahan Dotson because he wasn't being mocked at 11. He was being mocked late first round, early second round. He himself came out yesterday and said, honestly, like I was watching Suns Pelicans. I wasn't expecting to get picked this early. And it's not because he's not a good dude, right? It's just because there's so many wide receivers that he was thinking, okay, well, I'm a baller, but you know, you look at the other guys that are being mocked in the top 10, I'm probably going a bit later. I love, and I cannot understate or overstate, I can't even remember which word is the one to use right now, how much I love this pick, okay? Uh, I'm, yeah, by the way, I'm severely hungover. Um, shout out, Tony Zabrina. Congrats on your wedding. It was a blast. Um, <laughs> wow. Anyway, yeah, let's keep talking. So, Jahan <laughs> Dodson, I love, because I've watched a handful of Penn State games. I talked to Oliver Samuel Jacobus, who's been on the podcast a few times with us. Um, and I actually texted him, uh, seeing if he could hop on. Unfortunately, he couldn't. But I did ask for, hey, can you just tell me a little bit about Jahan? And so this is what he said. Dotson is a great get for the commanders. Safe, secure hands, and can play both on the outside and in the slot. Sneaky game speed with a ridiculous ability to control his body while making adjustments in the air for a contested catch. Okay, that's what Carson's going to let him do. See what he did to NFL cornerback and former OSU All-Big Ten player Sean Wade in 2020. Good punt returner, averaged 13 and a half yards per return and an underrated passer going two for two, 43 yards. So if we have a little gadget play, he could also throw it. Um, a great compliment for Terry. Nice addition for Carson. Dude is comfortable playing in the state of Maryland. His last game there, he set a school record with a stat line of 11 catches, 242 yards and three touchdowns. OK, I uh, then asked, well, other Penn State wide receivers like Chris Godwin and Allen Robinson, how does he compare to those? This is not sure I can compare them, uh, but if anything, I would say Dotson is like a strange offspring of Chris Godwin, KJ Hamler, now with the Broncos, uh, and Allen Robinson. Godwin has sweet hands. KJ has speed for days. Allen Robinson has the ability to go up and get the catch. Jahan is somewhere in the middle of those three. Okay, so he's he's a bit of a do-it-all receiver. Not elite speed, but is sneaky and enough for the NFL. He has great hands and is just so smooth after the catch and his ability to adjust his body in the air and control, it is elite. Okay, so that's what he had to say. Comparisons would be Emmanuel Sanders, Tyler Lockett. You land someone like that, round one, pick 16, you're pleased. Um, mm-hmm. I did want to note, so started doing a little more research on these other guys. Drake London, freak. I actually think he was worthy of being the top wide receiver off the board. He's 6'5", um, he's 2'10". He averaged 11 catches a game. He had 88 receptions in just eight games for USC this season. Uh, I think totally worth it. Congrats to Atlanta pick eight for taking him. The Ohio State receivers, I began to have a bit of a problem with because they, when you're evaluating them, great players, right? And they could end up being elite and that's fantastic. Um, But Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave, 70 catches, 65 respectively compared to Jahan's 90. Neither of them were the alpha. I thought maybe one of them was Jackson Smith and Jigba, who's going to be probably in next year's draft, had 95 catches on that Ohio State team. So the attention that Garrett Wilson is getting, the attention that Chris Olave is getting for these opposing defenses, it's all probably single coverage. It's all probably one on one. Jahan is getting doubled. He's getting in this quarterback play with also CJ Stroud as their quarterback versus we got Sean Clifford over here. The truth is Penn State fans know not very good, right? Compa- especially compared to a CJ Stroud. So Jahan has been the alpha for quite some time and he's seen double teams. He's seen zones schemed up for him and he's found ways to produce. There was only two games last season where he did not find the end zone. I mean, this guy is a stud. And again, no character issues. You think about Terry McLaurin and that leadership. Jahan brings that too. He's quiet. He works hard. No red flags whatsoever. James Franklin, head coach at Penn State, absolutely loves this guy. Um, I could have seen us maybe swinging for Jamison Williams if we'd stayed at 11. Uh, Coming off the ACL, it's a bit tough, so I understand not doing it. I love, absolutely love that we went Jahan Dotson at pick 16. And fans, you are going to love him because his floor, in my opinion, is safe. And we don't know what his ceiling is yet because the kid works. That's where I'm at. That's where I'm at, K-Dot. Um, any final thoughts? I don't thoughts? disagree with you. Yeah. I, don't, I don't disagree with you. But I, I think that 
right now what we're also seeing, and once again, we're going to talk about wide receivers, so I'll start off by saying, fuck you, Jacksonville. Um, <laughs> right. Okay. I think we're reaching a critical point when it comes to the wide receiver position, kind of like that come to Jesus moment we've had with running backs over the last like 10 or 15 years. I We're starting to see the success of rookie wide receivers be something that's just normal. They're, they're, they're really like, you look at just the numbers of these guys that are end, end up being in the upper echelon of catches, targets, or receiving yards the last few years, just coming out of college. It's been kind of ridiculous. Or you also look at the guys that have been second round draft picks or later recently that have turned into all-stars, AJ Brown, not a first round pick Tariq Hill, a fucking fifth round pick. Like there's, there's a lot of these dudes that because of the way that the football is kind of working now, from the time that you play Pop Warner through college and the type of systems that they have, the lack of contact that the defensive players are able to do to you, you're starting to see these freak athletes kind of become these wide receivers. And the, 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 the range at which you can get and what it is that you're really looking for on offense, I'd almost make it go, go as far as to say it's almost a can't-miss position at this particular point in time. And I think what you look for is you're, you start looking at some of those intangibles, like what you were talking about. And I think that's what Dotson really, really shines in. Is it like, it's it, it, same thing like you heard about Terry McLaurin is like natural leader, great route runner, sure hands. And then you see what you can do to scheme them in that offense, because the ways that offenses are being schemed with all these receivers that are just fat. Dotson ran a four, four, three. And it's not considered a burner. <laughs> Right. Compared to Chris Olave and those right. guys, because it's right. freaks that are kind of happening. Right. So I just think that right now you're just seeing this, the, 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 the window has kind of shifted as far as what it is, the benchmarks for wide receiver on the NFL. I don't know if I'm articulating it correctly, but it's just, I look at this and I'm saying, I, I don't think it is a miss. Like I, when you say Jameson Williams, it's like, I think he's incredible, but I also look at this team and be like, Hey, if I'm looking at it, I need somebody to can come in and play now. And James Williams might not be able to play right now. Well, he won't be able to play right away. And um, you've already had a Curtis Samuel who had to sit out. You've had a Kelvin Harmon who's had to sit out. You look back at the other Bryce Love who didn't even see the field. Like there's all these situations in which you 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 got these guys the the injuries or whatever. You just want somebody that could come in and play immediately. And I think with these receivers, especially nowadays. You can get that. And if you get this dude that could just slot into this offense right away with the healthy Curtis, Curtis Samuel coming back, that offense could be scary. That offense could legit be scary. And um, I, I just say, I think it's going to be really, really fun to see what we do on offense. I'm very excited to see what we can do on offense. There are now no excuses. Um, it is Carson's first year in the system, so we'll see how that goes. And uh, it is Scott Turner's first legitimate opportunity as an offensive coordinator with the quarterback that he essentially chose amongst and. Why don't we, you know, we will get to the first round because there was only one quarterback taken. It was Kenny Pickett and actually Malik Willis is still available. So we'll, we'll get to that craziness. But I, I just wanted to quickly highlight that to show, hey, people were low on this draft class when it came to quarterback. Right. So now looking at the Carson mm -hmm. Wentz trade, it looks better and better by the day. Right. Because if Malik is still mm -hmm. available and that's the evaluation of many, many teams, they could all be wrong. Malik could end up balling. Right. And maybe was worthy of being around one pick. But if everyone feels that way. Well, then you got to feel a bit better about Carson Wentz. You got to feel a bit better about this offense. And you have to be excited about the type of player we're getting in Jahan Dotson. Now, yes, he's not the Drake London who's 6'5", whatever, but we didn't even get a shot at him. I'm willing to bet if we stayed at 11, we would have gotten Drake London. So why don't we talk about that? So that was the trade that occurred. We were at pick 11, and then the New Orleans Saints picked up the phone. We picked up the phone, received their call. They said, let's make a deal. And the deal that was made was we gave the New Orleans Saints pick 11 and we received pick 16, which ends up being Jahan Dotson, pick 98 in the third round and pick 120 in the fourth round. OK, so we've talked about wanting to get more picks. We've talked about wanting to trade back. But I'm curious as to your thoughts, KDOT, because a guy you and I both had ranked number one at pick 11 was a safety from Notre Dame, 6'4", 220, who ends up going to the Ravens at 14, and Kyle Hamilton. So what were your thoughts on the trade back when it happened? What were your thoughts on the trade back when Kyle Hamilton was taken between 11 and 16? Um, go ahead. The floor is yours. All right. So 
closer to draft time, it was sort of acknowledged at that point, Washington wanted a receiver. And I think everybody going, at least when the, when the clock started, I think the, the consensus was they want Drake London. You, you, you go over Twitter, you start looking at it. It was like, all right, Drake London's the guy. And once that happened, it was almost like this reserve. I was like, okay, Drake London should be there at 11. He'll be the guy. And that'll be the end. all be all of that. Cause I still thought Garrett Wilson would probably be the first receiver off the board. And I thought you have that area, which we could still slot in right there at 11 and go get him, which um, didn't happen. So when we traded back out of when Drake, when Drake London goes to Atlanta, cause he gets what pick eighth to go to Atlanta. Eighth, correct. Then, it, then it's like, okay, I, I'm high on Olave, but it doesn't seem as though the team is as high on Olave. It is the vibe that I was getting, at least like following certain people on Twitter in the days leading up to the draft or whatever. And um, it was like, all right, well, who's going to be there for us? Because when Drake London got off the board and we were looking at him, like, look, there's a chance that Kyle Hamilton, Chris Olave, or Garrett Wilson, all three guys we had top, they're, we're going to at least be able to get one of these guys easily. Mm-hmm. And then the trade happens and it's like, okay. I guess it's not going to happen. And Olave goes off the board. Garrett Wilson goes off the board. And you're looking at Kyle Hamilton. You're like, all right, how far is he going to fall? And I do another podcast with this, uh, with, with a Raven fan and who was very, very high on Kyle Hamilton. He was looking at his 40 speed compared to Ed Reed. And there, the idea, like putting him near Marcus Williams on that defense, just, uh. so I'm sitting there kind of like, all right, there may be a chance that at 16, Kyle Hamilton's still going to be there for us, which is an exciting, exciting prospect. Um, with the trade back itself, I was like, all right. I kind of understood when you had that many guys on the board at that point, it looked like at least one of them was going to fall. So I was like, all right, it, it makes sense that we're trading back to 16. There's a risk you could take. This almost a calculated risk you can take. When, uh, when Baltimore then selects Kyle Hamilton and then you're looking at Wilson's off the board, Olave's off the board, and Hamilton's off the board. I was sort of like, I was in the place of, I was okay with trading back again. Interesting. I, I, I was, I was completely cool with trading back again. Cause if you look at like the, the, the idea that we kept hearing about this draft is that the topper echelon talent is not really exciting. Like, even if you like the, the guy who's first on my board is Kyle Hamilton, but he plays safety. It's not a premier position. Sure. Right. So it's not it's not quarterback. It's not receiver. Even nowadays, it's not corner. It's just. All right. He's great, but he's a safety. So you're really going to choose the safety that high. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I put more value in safety than other people, but you can see with the salaries and everything. And I felt that just don't do that. Um, but what, what, what you hear the most about this draft is that there's this mid tier talent in the second, third rounds that are where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. So when I hear that, I'm like, all right, well, we need to get as many guys pos- as many guys as possible in that mid-range. And look, that's where Washington is actually kind of excelled and done pretty good at, too. You look at the Terry McLaurins, who's been the second round players. Well, I'm kind of like, all right, these might be guys that might not have been on my radar. And I'm expecting to see a lot of guys get drafted that were not on my radar. But I want as many picks in that mid space, in that mid, in those in that second or third round as possible. So when when the when the pick ends up being Dotson, I mean. I then started doing my research because, I mean, I thought we were in love with Drake London, so it was kind of surprising to me that they didn't go trailing Burks because at least the same frame, but I guess they right. just didn't like him. Um, so, I mean, I'm selling myself on Dotson. I like Dotson fine as a player, but if I'm looking at the way that it all shook out, I would have been completely satisfied with trading back out of 16 because um, I'm looking at some of the other guys. Like, I don't know. If, if you tell me that we could trade back out of 16, get a couple picks, in the third round and still being a place to pick up a Devin Lloyd in the late twenties. Sure. Am, am I happy with that? Yeah. I think I'm pretty good with it. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where they were as far as the value add there for it. Like I, I, I guess they were high on Dotson, even though he wasn't on a lot of our radars, mm-hmm. but um, it just felt as though, all right, let's just collect picks. Like we're, we're at this position where we need to get as many picks as possible. Cause you look at this friend, you look at this roster some of the depth that's been a that's been a key cog in the way that we've done things has kind of gone away. You look at Settle's gone. You look at Ioannidis is gone. You look at that offensive line. There are guys that we want to keep. Like, I look at this team. I'm like, all right, 
there's a lot of people that we need and I want as many draft picks as possible. I mean, we, I know that there's probably more free agents that we're going to pick up in this off season, but I just let's stack them. Cause none of these guys in the first round really beyond one or two guys really excite me. Right. Kyle Hamilton excites me. Sauce Gardner excites me. Stingley excites me. Um, Malik Willis kind of excites me, but I also know he's a two-year project. So, mm-hmm. right. So I'm like, I, I think at that point I was just, I was, I thought that we were just going to be in a collect pick mode, which I thought might piss off a lot of Washington fans, but I thought it might be the best for the team. Yeah. I mean, you want as many swings as possible, right? Because you look at the statistics and a lot of these guys do end up becoming busts. And so that's why I actually like the Jahan Dotson pick from that perspective as well is because I think he has a safe floor, right? I think we know what we're getting from this guy. He's a very smooth route runner, like Oliver was saying. And also he has an ability to get off the line. And if you look at Garrett Wilson or Chris Olave, there were some question marks about that. And again, they're probably going against the number two or number three corner. One of them's in the slot where it's a bit harder to jam. And there's still some question marks there with Jahan. It's just that people didn't anticipate his ceiling being as high. He's 5'10", like, you know, 5'10 and a half or something like that. So, you know, his size isn't what people dream about when they're thinking about an NFL wide receiver. That, again, goes to a Drake London, right? Um, But when you look at, like, what he's not good at, it's really hard to pinpoint anything that Jahan's not good at. Because even though he's 5'10", he's known for making contested catches. So he's still getting up there and climbing that ladder. Um, Again, that's why I really enjoyed it from the trade back perspective. Uh, we were texting a little bit. We were like Kyle Hamilton 11. Like when Drake London went to Atlanta, it was like, mm-hmm. okay, it, assuming you and I were on the same page and we were about ranking Kyle Hamilton higher, we were like, okay, from our perspective, the team He's no longer it. can take Drake. So it must be Kyle. And so we were right. starting to get really excited. And then Garrett Wilson goes at pick 10 and it's like, okay, it's here it is. And then the trade back happens. And I remember being like, hmm. Okay. Okay. You see, you get 16 back, 98 back, 120 back. And you're like, all right, five spots. Can Kyle Hamilton survive that long? Chris Olave goes pick 11. I thought the team did a brilliant job talking about how much they love Chris Olave because by doing that, I think we scared New Orleans and I think we got those extra picks that we wanted. Great smoke screen. Right. Um, terrific smoke screen. Um, and we actually, and I was at this wedding. And dancing, of course, but also like, you know, grooving a little bit, got my phone like right here, you know, checking. What are we doing to pick 12? What's happening? Pick 13. All these trades are happening. And I'm like, what is going on? All these shoulders are moving. Um, And then 14. That's a match made in heaven, in my opinion. Kyle Hamilton and the historic I don't you know, success of the Ravens. I, I, I live in this city. I don't, I don't need it. <laughs> It feels a lot like Micah Parsons. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. It does. It does. It does. It does. Anyway, but and then, that, that, look, I, I, I'm going to be the one. Look, I, I will bitch and complain all next year if it happens. Trust me. That's I'm, fair. I'm putting it out there right now. I'm going to bitch and moan like a motherfucker. I <laughs> am going to do my best not to. Um, I will have I it on the record it. that I've wanted Kyle Hamilton since like December. <laughs> Uh, so I was sort of dreaming about yeah, you this. You convinced me. You got me. You got me off the. And now, yeah, fuck that. I'm off the. Now here's the thing: if he sucks, never hear me talk about him again. Ever, <laughs> ever. We never wanted him. We'll delete the video. Yeah, yeah we, we just that, never man. even did it. Yeah, yeah exactly. time, baby. <laughs> yeah, but very high on Jahan Dotson, and we we can't know whether it was a good deal or not until Jahan steps foot on the field, until Kyle steps foot on the field for the Ravens. And we still have two extra picks now. Um, So that's the thing that's so weird about the draft is that like draft grades and everything you get put out right now. And I love looking like old draft grades and seeing how some people think like certain drafts mediocre. I think we don't know shit. You can't don't know anything until they start getting on the field. And even when they get on the field, you still don't know the full picture until a year, two years, three years, sometimes for some of these guys. So like there, there is this calm down factor. And I think what Washington fans need to realize more than anything is like, they were going to go receiver. Yes. It's abundantly clear now. Right. They were going to go receiver. They want as many, they want no excuses for Carson Wentz. Which we as a fan base should be like, that's cool. Because now we get to really take the gloves off and be real as far as assessing these guys this season. There doesn't need to be, hell, give them the benefit of the doubt. 
No, we can we can truly say, like, no, dude, you got the weapons. Why aren't you performing? Scott Turner, you got the guys that you want on this offense. Where are you coming? So they're they're allowing us to hold them accountable, which mm-hmm. is which is a good thing. But knowing that they wanted to go receiver, you see, look at like I, I know a lot of people like, well, and you hear them talk about that they there were phone calls about being able to actually move back again from the 16th pick. Correct. And I think there's a lot of fans that are like, hey, well, I mean, Dotson was not anybody's radar. We could wait until that. We don't know that. There, there. If you know that they had maybe two guys, it looks like they had two guys on their list: Drake London, Dotson, one, yep. two. And if you look at the rest of that first round, there's only one other guy that goes, and that's Burks. Same frame as Drake London. We could have gotten it. Means that they weren't high on this dude. And if yep. that's the case, and that's what they're looking at with this board, then the last thing you want to do is get out of the first round. If there's a dude you know you want to go receiver. He's your second guy. You've already moved back once. Go and get your dude. So I don't think that people can look at it in the sense of like a reach as much as if they don't pick that, I don't think Dotson's on the board going in the final day or Dotson's on the board if we picking past pick probably 22. Because I mean, I'm looking at some of these teams like, yeah, like A.J. Brown is gone from Tennessee. Right. That's why they got the Traylon Burke. I don't know if they do they pick up Traylon Burks. Do they go John? I don't know where they had him on the list. So like I you go get your guy once you do what you know is there. Once you know. And, and here's a question for you. Which team do you think was trying to trade up? I have a guess. It's who? Green Bay. And who do you think they were going to take? And, a wide receiver. And, see, and, and, so, here, and here's the thing. And I was talking to Brendan and Brendan. I Brendan and Green Bay fans were high on Dotson. I didn't know he was high on that. They were like, no, high, high IQ guy. He's um, he, he's got sure hands. He's somebody that Aaron Rodgers is not going to get upset with if he, because he's going to make the plays and he can build a develop a relationship. And I'm like, you start feeling better about it. Cause it's like all the things you really want from a receiver that can go off the rip. I exactly. I just, if you're a fan of this team and you dislike Jahan Dotson, please let me know why. Because again, I'm, I'm trying to look for, we're trying to do our research here. We're trying to find flaws, right? He's name. not perfect, right? Yes. Yeah, apparently his name, because it's close to Josh. Not, Fox. Well, like, I think there's a part of that. Cause a lot of fan base is fucking stupid, but outside of you're that, you're talking about the actual hype and buzz. And stuff there, like that, of course, th- right. This draft since post COVID, the draft has been weird. Okay. Um, football games have been weird. The college football seasons have been weird. The, the, there has been a – we haven't seen certain guys on TV getting the same accolades that we usually typically see watching college football recently. You've got to really be tuned in to know who these dudes are. It doesn't feel like the hype is the same at all, with this, especially this draft class. And that would be a talent thing too. We spent the last few weeks prepping people for the draft. His name wasn't mentioned once. Not Even when once. I named – we named like 10 receivers – and his name wasn't mentioned. That doesn't mean that he he sucked it. It also means that we didn't watch enough college football. And I'll be the first to admit that we didn't watch enough college football. But, like, there are going to be names. There's going to be guys you have no fucking idea. But if you're completely being honest with yourself, look back at some of the other drafts in which you got. Did, how many of you guys knew who Terry McLaurin was? Seriously, really true. How right. Guys, how many of you knew who Terry McLaurin was? How many of you guys were excited when they called his name? Like, truly excited. How many people were bitching about uh, they just got his, they got Dwayne has his teammate is bullshit. Come on. He, we don't know. Calm down. Just calm it down. Just yeah. Calm it down. Yeah. Couldn't agree anymore, but now let's heat it back up. The rest of round yeah. one was, I mean, the whole thing was spectacular. Um, if you were a fan of the commanders, if you were a fan of the NFL, we commanders fans say you are welcome because we started the whole thing. We started the very first trade. Then pick 12 gets traded. Then pick 13 gets traded. Then Hollywood Brown gets traded. Then AJ Brown gets traded. Debo stays amidst all the chaos. Like what a first round K dot. What were your thoughts on the absolute insanity of that first round? I didn't. So I, I'm sitting here in my little command center basement area, right? So like I had my iPad here. Mm-hmm. And my iPad was playing, um, it was playing, uh, I think, Bleacher Reports draft coverage on YouTube. TV, I had ABC. Laptop, I had ESPN. Pat McAfee was on the phone. <laughs> and I'm just 
mind is blown and you hear all the, the you, then there's delays and there's certain, hey, oh my god what's happening with you? The, the, Pat McAfee also makes any draft seem 10 times more exciting than oh my gosh game. I watched some of it this morning I was oh cracking up he's great he's Fucking great day. but it was just nuts it was like, like you're waiting for the other dominoes to fall like I, I thought it wasn't over and I, Lord knows that I don't think it's over I think by the time the night uh, picks back up we lord knows what we're gonna see when hollywood brown goes to arizona you're like whoa what you're seeing the players react in real time on twitter also like they're whoa, what's going on you get lamar jackson wtf off the rip it's straight you're, up you're seeing all this right it's like what what is happening then you're looking at baltimore you're like oh well they just went and they got kyle hamilton there because he was on the board is debo coming to baltimore like there's just once it started moving, I don't think anybody knew what was happening or what was going to happen. And apparently, like, from what I understand, the Hollywood Brown thing was uh, was in the works for a minute. The A.J. Brown thing, we all knew that he wasn't going to resign. Tennessee was lowballing the shit out of him. Um, it's 16 mil. Come on, guys. Come mil. on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just ridiculous. But, hey, I'm, I, I look at that contract, and I'm like, hey. Things are getting more manageable as far as that Terry McLaurin deal coming up, which we should be able to get done. But it was just nutty. I don't, I don't think I've – there has not been a more unpredictable draft that I can remember. And that's, number one, because, of the, like we said, the talent, the, the dearth of talent beyond the top, like, two guys who are not necessarily at the positions at which you put the most value at, right? So it's really the wild, wild west of drafts. And when the trades start going out, it – there there was hardly any way to really truly know what was happening unless you were really dialed into a team and what it is they needed. And I think majority of us as casual fans don't know the ins and outs of all these individual teams as much. Yeah. Although I will admit, if you go talk to Brendan Nichols, who me and him were, I was nailing it. I was nailing most of the night. So I just want to give myself a little pat on the back. We'll go ahead and make sure Brendan comments on this video and, and you guys do the same, please, with what your thoughts on the craziness of round one. And I wanted to highlight, the New York Jets, who I think got the most value out of their mm-hmm. picks more than any other team. And I hate to say it, but shout out the Giants as well. I thought they did a great yeah. job getting Kayvon Thibodeau, who I don't understand why there were red flags around him. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, he's an NFTs. He is a monster on the field. Um, that's going to be tough. And then Evan the lack, Neal, of production at the, lack of production at the end. Uh, I mean, OK, well, I, I think he's going to be really good. But just to highlight the mm-hmm. Jets, they get Sauce Gardner at pick four. I think they were thrilled with that Stingley or sauce. They're both going to be, in my opinion, fantastic pros. Um, Then Garrett Wilson at pick 10, who he was mocked around that pick. They get him and then they managed to get back into the first round. And Jermaine Johnson, edge rusher from Florida State, who was at Georgia previously, got edged out because there are so many good Georgia players. My goodness. Um, Gets him going at pick 26. He was mocked top 10 this whole time. So for them to be able to get three guys that were basically being mocked in the top 10, top 12, I think is terrific value for them. I think they have to be very pleased with how things, you know, shook out. And yes, they lost some picks by, you know, trading up again to 26, but I think they have to be pleased. I thought the Jets were the big winners. Giants were also big winners. And of course, the Ravens with Kyle Hamilton. What what were your thoughts on maybe some winners here, Kata? New York, New York as a whole. The city of New York, right. The city of New York as a whole. But, I mean, I, I say that and also, I'm like, we never know how these things are really going to turn out, right? True. This I is just a, at, just a reaction. Yeah. Yeah, it's just reactionary. I'm like, I see two teams that actually did the most that they could across the board of their team to actually improve. So you, you, you look at, like, all these different key positions. They improved on all of them if you believe these players are the players that they can be. Um, that to me is good, but it's, but then you also say it's kind of easy to do that when you have multiple first round picks. <laughs> so it's, yeah, like, it's true. It's true. Right. <laughs> so it's like, point. okay, <laughs> do they really, or yeah, they got multiple picks. <laughs> they, they, they picked guys up. Um, so no, there's a balance there, I guess to me, but they're, they're winners because they got the most out of the first round talent which is great, but we still don't know until everything kind of shakes out. Right. And actually on that note, how about the Pittsburgh Steelers who got their pick of QB and everyone yeah. and their mother thought 
that Mike Tomlin, he's had dinner with Malik Willis, maybe even a couple times that they have been talking to him nonstop. And, you know, with last year with Najee, it seemed pretty obvious they were going to take Najee. They take Najee. This year, it seemed pretty obvious they take Malik Willis. I, I, I want to make a Kenny point Pickett. there on that one. Go ahead. I think what you're seeing, it just a thought to me. I, it was something I thought last night when it got brought up again. I think the death of Dwayne Haskins, the passing of Dwayne Haskins, uh, changed what the Pittsburgh needed to do in the quarterback room. Um, Interesting. Go ahead. When you had Dwayne, when they looked at the quarterback competition between Dwayne and Mitch Trubisky going into the season, I think a Malik Willis is a much easier pill to swallow because you have the time to project your quarterback. Um, I think with those two guys battling it out, whoever wins is going to be a guy that you can at least start some games with for a minute without the competition between Dwayne and Mitch. I think they needed somebody who was a lot more ready to step in immediately. Um, I, I do think that that's an actual line that I could pick. Like, I love the Kenny Pickett story in the sense that he's going to go play for his hometown team. Same thing with Aiden Hutchinson. I always love that story. Right. Um, right. Like it, so there's a part like Kenny Pickett, just, I look at that dude and I'm like, that looks like a Pittsburgh quarterback. Um, I just think that there, I think with the passing of Dwayne, it kind of changed what Pittsburgh is looking for. You can't necessarily, I don't think anybody's looking at Malik Willis and saying that he, he's not going to start his rookie season unless you got some gadget plays or right. something to kind of get him in there. Um, I actually look at him as a legit two-year project. And um, you got a team like Pittsburgh who usually is fairly calm and deliberate in the way that they do things. I, I, I think it's it's very that quarterback room is extremely different without Dwayne Haskins. Okay, I really do. I I understand the line of thinking. Um, I'm not sure I agree, but I understand where you're coming from <laughs> and, and because I think so. Mike Tomlin is resilient enough and strong enough, and that organization has proven that they're strong enough to do what they're going to do. And screw the media, screw the fans, whatever. They're going to do what they need to do. So if they are looking at that pick and they're going, who's our next starter for the next 10, 12 years, right? Then I'm not as concerned about Kenny being more ready right now. Malik, not. I'm happy to start Mitch the whole season, no matter how it goes. And if I'm Mike, I'm going, hey, Malik's not ready yet. Sorry. Like, you know, we're taking our time here. And I think people may be upset, but I think he's totally cool doing that. Mike is a strong, that's why I admire him so much. He's such a strong head coach and he's so personable. Like he not only knows the game of football, but he knows people, right? And he knows how to fend off criticism and rumors that what he hasn't had a losing season. He's before. also never had to worry about the quarterback position. That is true. That is true. That, I will that, give I you think that. That, that. That to me is something in which it changes everything. I think that like when you have a fan base, you have a team that's used to it. It's the same way that like when I we brought up Brennan, I bring up Brennan. I can't talk to him about building a football team. The reason I can't talk to him about it is he's had 35 years of Hall of Fame quarterback play that he, he lucked fan, yep. into, right? As a Packers fan. Like you get Brett Favre, who was a fucking nobody in Atlanta, throwing pick sixes left and right to Hall of Fame career to you have an Aaron Rodgers fall to your 20 something in the draft. And you got an older, hey, well, fuck it, let's just do it. And it works out after Aaron Rodgers sits on a bench for two years, right? Like, right. it's, I can't talk to you about what it takes to build or go through the trials and errors of anything when you have no idea what it's about. And I think with Pittsburgh is they haven't had losing seasons. They've mm -hmm. also had Ben Roethlisberger at quarterback. It helps a lot. Absolutely. Years, of right? course, of course. So I, I don't think that what they're looking, I, I, don't, I don't think they're looking back and saying that we, we're not going back to the Charlie Batch Tommy Maddox, uh, Cordell Stewart days. Fuck that. We we're not gonna have that period of time like that. Right. Where we're gonna we're, we're gonna worry about. And look, Mitchell Trubisky. He's Mitchell Trubisky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just. Saying, I'm saying. I'm just. Come on, man. He's Mitchell Trubisky. I get it. He's I get Trubisky. it. That's, but that's why they were rumored for somebody in the first round. They know that this I guy's know, ultimately I, I, a bridge. I, I, and, I, and I really do think that they would I, – I do think that Malik Willis, if there was a legit quarterback competition where they could say, all right, we got one of these two guys, and even if one of these guys suck, which, hey, Mitchell probably suck, and we got Dwayne. But now – but if you, if you got Mitch and he sucks, which Mitch might suck <laughs> – you can't throw Malik Willis into the fire. They will ruin him, right? So there's there's no buffer anymore. Given how crazy this NFL draft has been, what if Pitt, they're pick 52 right now, second round, they're like, you know what? 
Fuck it. Let's move up to Fuck 33. <laughs> We're taking Malik. Not and now. RG, <laughs> RG3 Kirk Cousins type deal. Yeah. yeah let's well, go. <laughs> fuck it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't believe that an organization actually did that and it was us. A- anyway, but that's that's a that's a total different aside. So you but... had Dan Snyder and Mike Shanahan in the same building. Oh my god. Yeah. Remember those days? <laughs> oh, how could you not? Um, let's let's talk about day two uh here in the NFL draft. We were thinking about talking about day three, which is rounds four through seven as well. But given the chaos, this is the closest thing to an NBA draft I've ever seen in the NFL draft with the number of trades that occurred and stuff like that. Draft. <laughs> we're going to talk about rounds two and three of which the commanders have two picks right now. They have pick 47 uh, and that's in the second round and pick 98 overall. That is in the third round. K dot any names or positions that you want us to look out for over here. All the positions except for quarterback wide receiver. Now, if they draft another wide receiver, we'll be pissed. We've got enough guys. I'm going to push we're back good. on quarterback, by the way, I'm going to push back. They might. Oh, if Malik Willis is there, let's go. Or Sam Howell <laughs> or Matt Corral. There's some rumors. It depends. I, I push back a little bit at quarterback this draft unless we have more picks. I agree with you. Just to be clear, I agree with you. I'm just saying maybe don't rule it out because it may happen. It may happen. I won't. I don't. I don't think I'll agree with it. Is what I is. I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm there. already setting. That, I'm, I'm with you there. I down, want right? other positions. It might yes. happen. I don't agree with it because of we need to start winning games. And we can't do it with a position we already have a guy that we're paying, and he's going to start this season, period. Um, and especially when I'm looking at quarterback next year, looks like it's going to be a better position to draft from. Um, that's the way that I, uh, that's the way that I'm, I'm feeling about that. Uh, but there's every position, man. I thought about it earlier. We need offensive line depth. We need defensive line depth. Um, the, the rumor this last week has been Deron Payne is basically on the trade block which late is shit. And I don't quite understand it because Deron Payne has been somebody I've been talking about trading for the last six months, ever since that sideline spat. It was like, all right, if one of these guys doesn't want to be here, let's get the most value for this dude. But now they're talking about Deron Payne being traded or being not necessarily uh, extended contract wise. Right. You lost Tim Settle. You lost Matt Ioannidis. The depth isn't quite there. Can can we go ahead and just highlight that for a moment? Because I know a lot of people are, you know, frustrated. And I just want to say that is totally fair. You should be frustrated because Mm -hmm. I don't know how that seemed like very poor planning to me, right? If you know that you're not going to sign Deron Payne, then you have to keep one of Tim Settle or Matt Ioannidis, or maybe even both. I don't understand what happened here. That just seems like lack of foresight. And it feels, and that's the only, that's the only troubling thing I have with this organization, this front office is that sometimes there is, like you look at the JD McKissick thing, it just feels as though yes. there's a lack of details with things, and it's just that's what's the point. full plan? And it's I think that's the only thing that ever gives me pause with this organization or that front office is like, did you guys really think this all the way through? Like I don't necessarily disagree with any of the moves that sometimes, but it's like it doesn't feel like it's part of a cohesive plan, and I I, I can't think that you're getting rid of Deron Payne without having a plan of like keeping some of these dudes that have shown that they're good, legit players and depth guys for us. So it's weird to me. But if that's the case, then we need to start looking at what we need to build up that depth on that defensive line. It's been a huge um, thing for us. But Chase Young could get hurt again. Montez Sweat could get hurt again. If Jonathan Allen gets hurt, where are we looking at as far as the depth? Maybe it's a little easier on the edge, but that interior needs to be worked on. And that offensive line, look, they've been a lot of plug-and-play guys that we've had through there, but – we need some dudes to step it up and uh, we we need more bodies because look, how many years as a Washington fan have we seen the offensive line go to shit and the rest of our season thrown? Right. It's happened too many times in the last 20 years that mm-hmm. it should be something that we'd never, we're never looking towards ever. Um, but that being said, I still look at what it is that I wanted us to do in that first round. And that is really addressing on defense, that safety to linebacker Buffalo nickel thing. Right. Um, and I, I, whether that you, it means you just got to go get a true safety or a true linebacker, whatever, that's the area of the team that needs to be addressed. So I'm looking at linebacker and safety, a few names, the Kobe Dean linebacker out of Georgia, uh, Brian Otsimaw. Oh, oh you're, you're just counting. Sorry. <laughs> Brian Otsimaw, uh, linebacker from Oklahoma, um, Chad Muma linebacker from Wyoming 
any of those guys should be around the second round. I think Nakobe Dean will probably not be there when we come around. But if he does, because this draft has been weird as shit, to me, that's a slam dunk pick. You, you just make the fucking pick. Uh, right. It's safety Kirby Joseph, safety out of uh, Illinois, and uh, Jaquan Brisker, the safety for Penn State. Yep. Uh, back-to-back Penn State guys. Fuck it, let's do it. <laughs> and then if you do want to do safety, Tariq Wooden, the uh, the cornerback from U, uh, UTSA, um, which a lot of people just don't know, but it's uh, smaller schools. This dude's been kind of on a few mock draft boards. I've read enough about him. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, could be interesting. Uh, I'm just going to say I go. I agree with those names. Um, I just wanted to also add a Roger McCurry from Auburn, uh, who's a corner, because you can never have enough corners uh, over here. And then Christian Harris, uh, linebacker from Alabama who plays inside, like, you know, I wouldn't mind that either. Again, at this point, as you could tell from the Jahan Dotson pick, trust your board. If that's what you have, roll with it. I don't care if they're projected to be third round. If it's late third round, that's different, right? Because then that's a situation where maybe you could just wait at 98 and get that guy, right? I'm not advocating, hey, someone that should be going at round five or six, by all accounts, is suddenly taken to round two. I'm just saying that, hey, right. um, it's almost like a fantasy draft. If you know that it's a reach, but they're not going to be there for your next pick. You sort of just have to swallow it and do it. Uh, so if there are any players like that, do it. Absolutely do it. Because in the case of Jahan, it maybe wasn't going to be there at 22 if you traded. Um, and so maybe these guys that maybe are supposed to be going 50 to 65 or 50 to 70 even, take them. Honestly, take them at 47 if you think they're not going to be there by the time you're picking the guy. So we'll see what happens today. Um, but I also be cool with the trade back. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you want to keep And I think that picks, needs to be something yes. that, yeah, like we, we a trade back for something later in the second round and an additional third round pick, we need picks. And it's yeah. not picks because, look, I'm not a fan of the draft. I fucking hate the draft. As much as you know that I told you about television setup and everything, the draft mm-hmm. exists. I'm a football fan. I'm going to watch it. I don't think the draft should exist. It should just be a rookie free agents class, whatever. Fucking bullshit anti-capitalism. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, keep going, uh, keep going. <laughs> go get your guy. Look, the, the, the craziest pick of the first round easily was done by Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots with Cole Strange. Which yep. the only reason you pick him there is if he's Stephen Strange's brother and he's got the <laughs> fucking time stone. Okay, um, Fucking weird in seeing uh oh Sean McVay's reaction where you know Sean was kicking back a few. Yeah, it was oh, amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, it was amazing. So good, so good. You should see that if it, you haven't seen it. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, please Google that shit right now. Um, but but then but then again, it's like, all right, a guard that's going to New England. It might be a reach to us. Bill Bell doesn't give a shit. He went and got the guy that he wants, and right. that is one position that you know he's not going to really miss that. So you can go with this whole trade value book when you got a guy and there's a risk that someone else is going to take that guy, go get him. Just do it. Absolutely. Um, One thing I also wanted to mention, um, Chad Muma, I believe there was a comment, I can't remember from who it was on one of our previous (laughs) videos, where this guy was talking about Chad Muma a lot, with a lot of enthusiasm, stuff like that, out of Wyoming. So if we did get a Chad Muma, Hey, cool. And shout out to you. <laughs> you, shout know, out to you. you. We don't know your name right now, but shout not out at to the you. moment. I am again, we'll severely, <laughs> severely hungover right now, but we are still bringing this to you. Um, and also Troy Anderson is someone to look out for. John Kime of ESPN.com who follows the team and covers the team uh, has mentioned that he could be someone that could address that Buffalo nickel position, Montana state linebacker. It doesn't have to be a safety that you take for that Buffalo nickel. It just needs to be someone versatile. And Troy Anderson seems to fit that bill along with Jaquan Brisker from Penn state. But um, I think that's pretty much it. I'm glad you guys enjoyed round one of the NFL draft. If you didn't, I hope you enjoyed this episode as well. And round two, is tonight 7 p.m. You can see it on ESPN and any streaming service these days, even on YouTube. Follow, there's some awesome streams out there. You could just follow the draft that way as well. Um, but this was District Divided, a DC sports co- podcast, excuse me, covering the Washington Commanders. I am Amit. That is KDOT. Thank you guys so much for listening. And we will see you next week where we talk about the rest of the draft, how it went, and now moving into the offseason, what needs to be done. Until then, take it easy. The show Severance on Apple Plus, whatever the fuck they call the streaming thing, is legit. Go watch it. I need a new show. That's perfect.